Um, this is um, borrowed from, shamelessly borrowing from Noam Chomsky's lecture from about 10 years ago, Education for Whom and for What, in which he unpacks American education system and, and initiatives and about pretty much for the duration of that, uh, uh, of that system. Uh, a lot of parallels are, are also with the UK system because the Americans copied the, U the British in the first instance and then that copying went the other way. That's why it's a very relevant piece of uh, thinking and analysis. So I'm going to talk about Ames and Bill Prolog. Um, then what is education for? Therefore, leading you to kind of think about what is education research for? If you can uh, really you know, grapple with what is education for? What is this conundrum? And then we talk about complications from fallen faculty to rampant ref, whatever I mean by that. And there'll be a musical outro. So hopefully that will be a, and I hope to finish in about 15, 20 minutes and provoke some debate maybe, uh, about five minutes, and then we can call it a day. Uh, right, so my aim is to initiate a debate. Fairly simple aim. So looking for or looking at is always about who is the looker, right? Uh, C.S. Lewis, the guy behind Narnia, was a very religious guy. And I always quote this when I want to get this across, that we all are little little um, instantiations of whatever ideological, whatever uh, convictions that we are born into or happen to be around. So C.S. Lewis had this great quote about God, which I think is a great quote about all of us, you know, in our ideological worldview, what we think the world is about. God is not the light I see, God is the light by which I see. So our, our, our way of going about the world is not something that we can consciously quite assess uh, uh, so readily. So we have to be conscious of that. As researchers specifically, we have to be as much as uh, sort of get ourselves outside of that. Now, um, yes, this is uh, um, Noam Chomsky and Andrew Marr, and he was just starting in his uh, career. And uh, it's a, quite an interesting half an hour. This is on the occasion of um, Manufacturing Consent, the book by Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky, which talks about media manipulation and what we call fake news that we already know about, but only lately. But this has been going on for about a century. It's a science that was developed um, that's principally by Americans, American commercial and then political system. And um, so uh, Chomsky reminds uh, Mar about Orwell's uh, original, um, original um, uh, foreword to Animal Farm in which Orwell says, yes, I'm right about totalitarian systems, but in England, in the free democratic England, that's not all that different. And he says, pop, unpopular ideas can be silenced without any force. He says, uh, in England, it's about not what, not about how much you can't say, but what, what even do to even think. So this is 1940s, Orwell writing about this. And this is uh, uh, Noam Chomsky reminding Andrew Marr about that. And, and there is an even more telling ending to this uh, to this uh, interview, Chomsky says that it's perfectly true that the majority of journalists, this is in England, in the West, at 1990s, are trained to have, to have it given into their heads that this is a crusading profession, adversarial, we stand up against power, very self-serving view. On the other hand, in my opinion, I hate to make a value judgment, but better journalists, and in fact, the ones who are often regarded as the best journalists, are quite different picture, and I think a very realistic one. And then Mar comes in <laughs> very passionately, he says, but how can you say that I'm self-censoring? <laughs> and Chomsky says, I'm not saying you're self-censoring. <laughs> what I'm saying is you wouldn't be there. You wouldn't be filtered to that position that you are in had you dif had different thoughts, different ideas. This is how the filtration system, education and media works. And uh, he talks about he's not a team player, kind of would be the assessment of somebody who doesn't quite agree with the with the ideological view of, of uh, in a, on our graduate panels and all that, all other editorial rules and every other position of power. So it's a very interesting, and, and uh, the, the, this the cutout that I've got here uh, is uh, this is a three minute cutout from the 30 minute interview. You get stunned kind of my space at the end of this, like, you know, how I never thought about this, that I might be not quite seeing what, um, uh, so that to me uh, makes it, um, uh, on the sort of socio-political nutrition and, and, and nurture kind of way of looking at things. Also, anybody who hasn't seen this, this is American philosopher Daniel Dennett. Uh, he's uh, dangerous means. He produced 15 minutes of uh, of, uh, of a TED talk uh, back in 2002, which was a ground. It was eye-opening for me. How uh, the virus of the mind, how we can surrender our biological agenda to, for the ideological agenda for the means. 
like parasites uh, go into into an animal and then get that animal to be, behave on the behalf and for the purpose of the parasite, not for its own biological purposes. So it's ideological kind of driven kind of uh, uh, behavior that we are, uh, and, and these memes, these viruses code for that behavior. Give you an example, when you sneeze, you sneeze for the virus to kind of go to another host as well as other reasons for it. Similarly, when you have an ideological kind of little uh, conviction that drives you, you, <laughs> you, you do behavior, you do things that you wouldn't, I mean, the extreme ones is the cause for suicide bombers who give their biological agenda, their life and their ability to procreate just for the idea of that, uh, of that ideology. But there are gradations and shades of that. But it's a very good thing about how we should, as researchers especially, be very much aware of what we are bringing to them, what we are looking for and what we are looking at, whenever we are looking at something. Uh, now, this is uh, supposed to be um, on your screens now. Uh, can you? Uh, yeah. Yes. I mean, just a couple of words. What do you think education is for? And that would be, uh, and those of you who might want to, uh, I can maybe mask your voice in the recording if, uh, if need be. But uh, what, what would be a couple of words, maybe a couple of sentences at the most? I think it will take 250 characters this. Uh, so I'm already about 10 minutes in. So maybe another 30 seconds and just to get some. And if you can hit send at the end, just to sort of uh, make sure that it's on the screen. And perhaps we can revisit this uh, at, the, at the very end to see what, what ideas we have of, uh, of and what this talk may have uh, changed, <laughs> or at least uh, um, self-awareness and self-improvement, that's very uh, uh, a good one as well, yes. Um, now, uh, maybe one more, I think there's a couple of colleagues going for this, so just one more and then I'll, and I'll move, and maybe we can come back to this if there is more to inspire, to motivate, okay. So I think that's uh, for the public good to challenge what may be accepted, right? Very good. I think you know so far it's really. Uh, I'm glad we don't have a, you know, like employability is also a very important aspect. But uh, usually the first thing to go is to, to get people jobs. Um, now, uh, so uh, let's go with uh, with some titans. Democracy must be reborn in each generation, and education it is it's it's midwife, right? I'm joking uh, with the free education W, so, <laughs> but that's, that's on, the, on the Douglas Adams' is, uh, time is illusion, lunchtime W, so. So I think this is a, this is a really kind of a nice uh, encapsulation of what we should think about when we think about uh, um, uh, um, what we are doing when we are in with a group of students. With that in mind, I'll just, uh, again, a small teaser, write a couple of words on what comes to mind when looking at this picture. Just uh, perhaps one word or two words, or or or, or uh, what is this? This is an example of some educational kind of event, right? So, uh, given what we've just talked about, midwife to democracy, right? What does this make you feel, think, uh, and and how is this midwife to democracy in this particular scenario, in this particular instance? How is this midwife performing? Yes, thank you. So this is opposite. It's anti-democratic or anti-educational. Um, what I've coined when I was there was a, uh, there was a lot of um, uh, discussion about when we moved from canvas to teams, and the reason being because you can have more than hundreds <laughs> in virtual room. And it's like, is that what we are going for? We want even more people in one room, shutting up and putting up with whoever is telling them something, right? There's no dialogue, there is no way of, of going about this. So this is, to me, inclusive exclusion. You bring them all in, and then you exclude them all together. That's, that's the identity politics versus class politics, right? There in that, in that little, you know, they want you to look at identity politics, to talk about all other things except for class politics. This is a, there is, you know, a way of not having this in our system. There's plenty of money in the system to not have this to have a dialogue, to have one teacher and five students following them around. <laughs> there is enough, again, I won't go back into that, but it, there, is, there is a lot of things that in the 60s, and I mentioned it in the seminar, the previous one, in the 60s, in UK, teacher, banker, and medical doctor were making the same wage. What happened, right? This is not normal. We shouldn't get used to this. We shouldn't research. We shouldn't look for things that are already laid to us that are, that are normal within this kind of a, 
state of that uh, state of uh, uh, the dynamic that we have today. So this is not acceptable in the 21st century. If you have something like this, make a podcast. Do not bring your students in to teach them to, to shut up and put up because this this is anti-education. If you have that many students and you need to get them something and you can't have a dialogue, do not bring them into. I know I'm saying this is naive and you have to because that's the part of the, 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 the contract, right? But uh, maybe our thinking can change and maybe that the rest can follow in, in, in a way. Just to have that idea of what, what, what we should be doing. So this is from 2014. Many detractors, but go check this. Princeton University, uh, Martin Gillens. He did a thorough research from the 60s America to 2008. So concluding with a... Did anything you can imagine, from policies to, to uh, parties in power to electoral cycle, it took anything into account, proving decisively that America is plutocracy. America is not a democracy, right? And to the extent that that UK looks like the USA, we can say that, uh, and we talk about education system as midwife to democracy. Seemingly, we are failing, Not again, not we as we are. But, um, and this is another thing, to be a researcher, you need to be a researcher at language first. This is Paolo Freire, 101. The critical thinker, creative thinker, disruptive thinker should think of the words that they've given or read and think about what they, who, who came up with them. Who calls this system a democracy? What should make this system a democracy, right? What we should be seeing, right? And then you see the, there is a, in a, in a um, in the um, ancient Greeks to, to modern kind of times, the inequality and democracy are antithetical. You can't have unequal democratic society. For the ancient Greeks, the solution was to do away with inequality. For modern Democrats like Madison, Jefferson and so on, reduce democracy was the answer, right? So to preserve our wealth. Don't get, it's a polyarchy. USA was established as polyarchy, right? Now we have this lie perpetuated that that's a, that's a democratic system. So everything comes from that. This is, you know, there's papers and things proving that there is no way you can have a democracy. Uh, capitalism is predicated on inequality, democracy, on equality. And if you have an education system that should birth democracy, you kind of have a birth into what? into what, into, into a hostile environment which doesn't allow for that. Now, um, how, why we failed and continue to fail, and I'm, I'm going to now go with through this. This is the, the one lecture that inspired all of this. Um, this is about an hour of really unpacking and unpicking in short terms. When democracy started flourishing in the 60s, civil rights movements, then we have uh, 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 assault on democracy, which is what Chomsky uses that word, uh, when they introduced fees for education, when they made it less accessible for the lefty ideas to be discussed to be in universities. And then you have what we have now in UK, we have trade for education, private luxury concept of education, not public good, uh, which is the sort of a, 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 the kind of deformation that we are now operating within as researchers in this field. Um, another thing to see what's been uh, the, this sort of model of business kind of serving the business agenda, we are now run by the administrators. The last bastion democracy in this capitalist system was the, the academia, where we as academics could decide what to do, how to spend our time, decreasingly so, according to uh, Ben uh, uh, Ginsberg. Uh, he's conclusively against a book, very good book to read, to uh, explain everything, professionalization of teaching and all that sort of, uh, you know, as if academia is, is not enough. We need to be more business-like. We need to, a lot of very, very interesting things. Of course, get into research too. For administrators who increasingly run our business here, uh, research is just a product to sell. It's not what we academics feel, you know, something a life a life uh, uh, focused and life uh, enhancing thing. Now, uh, um, Bologna, so I'll read this out and I'll just read through the rest of it. 
This was in 2016, Slavoj Žižek, a philosopher, opining on the Bologna reform and, you know, this idea of, uh, he says, uh, which is uh, what I put in functional versus creative or critical disruptive literacy. Functional literacy is to do your job as you are told, right? And it's what increasingly we do at universities. We, we get our students to be functional literate, to do their job when they leave, right? But he gives this example because it was in Paris around the time the suburb was burning, suburbs of Paris were burning, there was some unrest. And he says, uh, we need educated psychologists to tell us how to control the crowd. We need urban planners to tell us how the city easier to control, to control cities easier, right? That's what we need education to get these, to churn out these, these sedatives, right, to the, to, the, to, the, to the problem. But I think these are experts, but a true intellectual is not in the sense of an expert. He doesn't provide answer to problems, questions formulated by others. He questions the very way a problem is described. And he talks about public and private use of reason, which is Emmanuel Kant's idea. Very interesting. And again, I, I, these are just the teasers for you. So um, Julian Stalbras uh, on her RT before it was censored in this country. This was a professor, a professor from a from a uh, university. I forget now from. Uh, uh, but he was talking about how ref is uh, is. Uh, a faceless panel uh, is looking at your research and coercing you to do research in a particular center field of that, what they find is useful to them to keep the system going. If you want to play on the margins, you are allowed, but you're not going to get the points, you're not going to get the funding, so you're going to be switched off, you're going to be censored, basically, in a, in a way. So again, very interesting uh, uh, academic. Uh, um, by way of conclusion, uh, the, the unit of analysis in that video that I did uh, for Ed D, which is kind of inspired this, another counter, uh, counter argument provided by another academic in this institution, I won't mention the names, but uh, their, their context of unit of analysis, other academics in UK are doing it, so therefore this particular view or approach is uh, uh, okay. My, my the global unit of analysis is a global, we are living in a global world. You have to look at the education systems and how they go about education, what rate of invention they have, what rate of success they have, and how we can compete as, a, as, a, as, a, as you know, from this end, what we think of research, how we go about education, right? And on that level, the picture doesn't look so agreeable as, as um, the unit of analysis of UK, if I'm looking myself in UK terms. Now, um, on the words, <laughs> and this is really, I mean, I, I play this with my students, it's the most interesting thing I've ever come across. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, the song Ironic uh, from Bailanis Morissette from the 90s, for those of you who are <laughs> members of the 90s, was a big hit. Not, an in, no, not a single verse or instance of Ironic that she made is actually an instance of Irony, right? So these two ladies, or one lady with, uh, I think, uh, I hope it's gonna... It's really nice. No map to make, it's a free ride. When you get mucked on the way, we got good advice. of that song to actually correct Alanis Morissette. And if you remember anything about Alanis Morissette, she was intelligent, she was cool, right? So in our culture, Absolute nonsense passes for uh, intelligent highbrow, even a pop kind of thing. And I find that very, very telling, you know, that where we are, we are now discussing democracy, freedom of speech, you know, journalism, <laughs> all of these things. We haven't got a clue what, what these things mean because we are so far from, uh, from a lot of things. And then we're trying to research in education. What are we researching for? Are we researching for the system to continue going like this? Because that's where the funding comes from, right? We need to follow the funding. But what we are doing, we are going following this this uh, uh, this uh, slippery slope down to some really, you know, worse and worse situation in which we have more food centers, in which we have more fake news, and we, you know, sense of this, sense of that. We we scream at each other. We have more unrests, or. Uh, we try to do something and I'm not here to tell you what we can do. What I'm saying is as research and education we can at least have this perception of you of, uh, of, of you know what we're dealing with when we're dealing with these uh, it's in a way one of my little and I'll finish with this one word that Paolo Freire uses demythologize the culture. Decolon decolonize is another empty empty term in my opinion but demythologize right to kind of discuss so i'm hoping to demythologize this idea of research or academic research being anything but uh, you know what you make of it
you know, by doing it alone, it doesn't mean you're doing it right. You, you're doing it progressively or you're helping anyone. You may be just getting some funding and get helping yourself or helping the system to live another day. I'll stop there.